really pleased uh, today uh, to have as our speaker Michelle Cove, who is an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Public Health Sciences here at UC Davis. Um, Dr. Cove's work examines how policy, healthcare, and our social structure are interconnected and their impacts on disadvantaged communities. Her research includes healthcare safety net, Medicaid, long-term care, access to health care for minority populations, diversity in medical education, and the health care workforce. It's quite a few things. I need to hear a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's wonderful. So um, actually, um, Dr. Ko is a recipient of one of our uh, small grants, um, which she will focus her talk on today. Um, she mentioned to me a lot of it. It's still preliminary, but it is still devote, um, developing. Um, I think this is really appropriate uh, to have uh, Michelle talk to us today because we just released um, an announcement for another funding opportunity through our center. This is our rapid response um, short-term funding. So and this is, again, what yes. Michelle had um, for her project. And so please see our website um, for additional information. Um, Heather, did you want to add anything further to, to that announcement? I don't think so. No, okay. that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Sounds like we covered it So we'll turn the time over to you, Michelle. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Do you want me to sit here? You're fine. Do whatever you want to do. Should I stay on? You can do whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you again. Um, and Nice to see the turnout this more than I expected on I met. Um, so I'm um, a health services researcher, which means I study healthcare delivery systems and healthcare policy, and um, that's why there were so many different topics on that list. What I'm going to talk about today are different um, pieces of projects and also some just descriptive overview as well about just healthcare in the San Joaquin Valley, and particularly I'm going to talk about the Central Valley today. Um, and so just to be, to clarify, and I think most people in the audience will know that the San Joaquin Valley can stretch pretty far north to south. I'm going to talk specifically about these eight counties right in the middle, sort of starting with San Joaquin at the top, and going down through San Salas, Merced, so on, and down to, to Kern. And so as I'm showing data and the study is there, the, the region that I'm talking about specifically today is from here. Um, and I think it won't be a surprise to most people here that one, there's a lot of people, there's over four million people in this region, um, that there are high rates of poverty and low income over the, the majority of the population is low income. And that translate um, in healthcare world for us, it means like almost half the population is either covered by Medi-Cal, which is California Medi California's Medicaid program, or is uninsured. Um, and we'll do the breakdown in a minute. Um, so I wanted to say first, sort of to ground things, I'm not from the Central Valley myself, and in fact, I'm not even from California, I'm from the East Coast. Um, and my first experiences um, with healthcare in the Central Valley are actually about maybe 13 years ago. My husband is from a town in the Central Valley called Mendota, um, and he happened to leave I think just shortly before some folks from UC Davis came down and did a farm worker health study on this exact town. Um, but certainly some things that were similar in, in this time period where my, my father-in-law was getting older, he's got a really complicated medical history and conditions. And to, so for him, most of the time getting health care meant driving to Fresno, which is depending on who's driving 45 minutes to an hour away. Um, and that meant a lot of things. One of the patterns that I saw were certainly that um, as he was declining, he went to the emergency department a lot. There's sort of a big hurdle, you know, there's sort of a big hurdle mentally if you, if you were sick, like how long do you wait to, because you really want to drive that far. Driving was difficult. And so he was in, the, in and out of the ED and coming in presenting pretty late in whatever condition he had or exacerbation he had. Um, the other thing that was striking um, to me at the time was that it was really hard for him to get any specialists to come see him. We, um, I, I think in that, in just a couple of years, 
probably in one year or maybe even two years, I went to almost all the EDs in Fresno because he kept going um, except for Kaiser. And it didn't really matter um, if the ER physician thought that they needed a specialty consult. Um, if I thought so in my relatively limited knowledge, having just graduated from medical school and, and my husband who was in training ahead of me, even if everyone felt that that was needed, it was really, really hard to get anyone to come. Um, the, that you, they were, irrespective of specialty, whatever it was, they'd call the person on call, the person on call would decline and say, no, I, I don't think so. Um, and I thought, and that was just sort of probably my first taste of what it was like. I mean, um, he had Medicare, so his insurance was relatively better than a lot of people, because um, he also has a supplemental plan. Um, and like I said, it didn't really matter which hospital we were at, it was the same thing time and time again. Um, the very last time he went in, we, um, he had a stroke. There was no neurologist or neurosurgeon who would come to see him until finally the ER doctor ended up calling some friends who were faculty at UCS at Fresno because the on-call sort of physicians wouldn't come in. So at any rate, um, I think that, that to me really was my, um, gave me a taste of what it was like. Um, and how there were access issues and, and what some of the challenges would be. Um, and so as it happens um, now, 13 years later, it's, I'm now finding, I feel like, the time to look at it more as a researcher and, and thinking about these issues from a research perspective. Um, so, oh, so smaller than I thought, just to, to acknowledge off the top, thank you again for the Western Center for Ag Health and Safety for both the seminar and also for the rapid response grant. Um, some of the other funding has come from uh, my own department. Um, I got a little bit of funding for students from a diversity and inclusion innovation grant. Um, and then I'll be presenting some work I've done on a larger project about for the state um, that was funded by the California Healthcare Foundation and with some folks at UCSF. Um, and I just want to acknowledge I have a, I've had a number of great undergraduates um, who have been helping me on this project. Um, so first, I'm going to talk, uh, give an overview of healthcare in the Valley, talking about health insurance coverage, some population estimates on access to care and quality, then looking at physician supply in the Central Valley and how it compares to the state, and then the next piece looking at a little bit of a few of the characteristics of those physicians, um, and then a bit of the qualitative research that I've done that was largely supported by this grant on what the experiences are of primary care providers currently in the valley. So, um, this first slide um, is health insurance um, coverage for valley residents um, by their citizenship. And so this might be a little hard to see through the back, but the yellow bar are people who are US citizens. Um, the aqua is naturalized citizens. The purple is non-citizens. And then the maroon is, is all. Um, this is from the California Health Interview Survey. They're publicly available data, so I don't have a differentiation in the non-citizen category between those who are documented and here on visas or permanent legal residents versus those who are undocumented. Um, but I think the, the main points are simply that amongst the uninsured, for non-citizens, the uninsured rate is still very high. It's over 20%. Um, and then uh, for in the Valley, I think also to notice for all groups, Medi-Cal is really important. Um, Medi-Cal, like half of the non-citizens are covered by Medi-Cal. Um, even over 40% of the U.S. citizens are covered by Medi-Cal. And so um, this has its own implications as we get to, to access to care about how important Medi-Cal is to the Valley. Um, and so same thing also from the California Health Interview Survey. And I'll, I'll walk you through the table. Um, the table percentage is the percentage of each um, of that insurance group who reported um, answers on each of these items. So the first row is the survey asked people, did you have any difficulty getting primary care? Um, and as you can see, it's the highest proportion who reported that was Medi-Cal at 11%. Um, but not, um, it was actually not as, not terrible. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, and then you'll see, kind of as you see through, when we talk about difficulty getting care, you'll often see that uh, the uninsured percentage, which is the next category, will be slightly lower because there's a mix of people who are going to say no to the questions because they're not even going to try to get medical care. And so it's expected that the uninsured percentage will, in many cases, be lower on this. 
Um, the next row is asking people to, if you knew you needed specialty care, did you have difficulty getting specialty care? Um, and there, uh, it was fairly high. It was over a quarter of Medi-Cal patients had difficulty getting specialty care and 20% uh, of those uninsured. Um, and then the next question is if you see a usual, if you have a usual source of care, who do you go to regularly for health care? Um, and you can see almost half of those on Medi-Cal are going to a community clinic. It's nearly 43%. Um, and then of the uninsured, it's 38%. And interestingly enough, even those who are on Medicare, it's 17%. So it's fairly high. Um, I think historically, particularly in rural areas, the traditional model has been there's a private practice, there are private practices and they will see a range of patients, including Medicaid patients and uninsured patients and, and those who are privately covered. And we can see um, there's, there's a real shift, and particularly in the Valley where the community health centers are picking up a lot of the Medi-Cal care responsibility. Um, and that comes up later as sort of reinforced as we'll get Oh, so we'll get to it as I look on the provider side. And then people who said they have no usual source of care, not surprisingly, nearly 40% of those who are uninsured, so they have no regular place to go to for health care. Um, and even 20% of those with Medi-Cal. So again, even if you have Medi-Cal coverage, it doesn't mean you necessarily have um, as many options of places to go. And then, um, the last one was asking people, have you, has there been a time in the last year where you've foregone medical care? I don't think foregone is the right word in the survey. That's the word we use. <laughs> it's probably have you not gone to see a doctor or gotten your prescription or something, even though you know you needed it. Um, and again, not sort of surprisingly, it's 76% of those who are insured said there was some time where I, I need medical care and I didn't go get it. Um, and interestingly, in the contrast though, you can see the, the lowest percentage of this group is actually the Medi-Cal. Even people who have Medicare and who have private insurance have say, um, we haven't you know, gone to care that we know we need it. Um, and just to note, when you ask people what is the number one reason, for all these th latter three groups, it's cost. The reason they didn't go get medical care when they needed it was because the cost was too high. For the Medi-Cal group, the number one reason was the health system was problematic in and of itself. I didn't go because it's just too hard to get there, it's hard to make an appointment, or something of that nature. Um, and then there's just a few, This is I'm just presenting maybe two pieces on quality of care and the value. Um, there's something called the California Regional Healthcare Cost and Quality Atlas. If anyone's kind of curious, you can look up where you, we are or you are and look at <laughs> how your own health care plans are doing. Um, and so this one is just aggregate looking at um, people with diabetes should be regular, have their hemoglobin A1C regularly checked as part of their monitoring. Um, and looking at, um, on the right hand side, we'll see, it's called Central Valley North, but it is actually the same counties that we're talking about in this aggregate. Um, that among diabetics, about three quarters of them got their A1C check versus people with private insurance in the Valley, which is 85%. But for reference, the state average is 88, the national benchmark is 89. And so we can see there's some decrement in quality of care in the Central Valley um, in general, and then more so for people who are on Medi-Cal. Um, and then one of, on the, the flip side of one aspect that's very, very difficult to have get across the board for people is colorectal cancer screening. So you can see nationally only 60% of people are getting the colorectal cancer screening they're supposed to on, uh, based on the recommendation. Um, but then you can see within private insurance in the Fresno area, it's 55%, and then with Medi-Cal it's 17 and a half percent. So um, certainly uh, there are real access challenges here that are becoming reflected and measured as quality of care challenges. Okay, so um, this first part I'm gonna present is just a little bit of overview is from a report that I co-authored with sent back to ECSF um, and it was called, they, they decided to title this actually, which is California Physician Supply and Distribution Headed for a Drought has a very stark picture of some incredibly dry right. land. Um, but I think just the few takeaways I wanted to show were 
Um, I'll explain quickly. What this was, was we used um, data from the Medical Board of California. Uh, the nice part about it is this, the Medical Board uh, handles licensure for physicians, and physicians have to get relicensed every two years. And when you do, there's a survey, and it conveys the impression that can, doing this survey is mandatory, even though it's actually not. But <laughs> what that means then is the response rate is very, too, very high, it's about 92%. So we have a fairly good um, capture of all the positions in the state. And, um, and then, as I'll show you, some of it, what I've, the cuts that I'm going to show you are down to physicians who are active in practice, who say they're not retired, who are not in training. Um, and we'll get to later, and then some about their patient care, those who are providing patient care. So the first part is just to show, and then this is, I see it's kind of faded, but. This is a map of the counties and it's showing the number of primary care physicians per 100,000 residents in each county. And so the darker blue counties have more physicians, so you can kind of see up here in the Bay Area, we, there are a lot more physicians per capita. And then you can see in here, the, the lowest areas in our state are in, down in the central <coughs> area, a little bit north, um, and then also Inland Empire. And so certainly throughout in our state, as it's not surprising um, that sort of the rural and ag region, regions are going to have the fewest doctors per capita. Um, and so here are the numbers. The state average is 50 per 100,000. In the valley, it's 39.4. In the Inland Empire, it's 34.5. The Bay Area is 64. Um, again, not surprising. Really. The other... Um, area of interest and concern from the state perspective is sort of the age distribution of the physicians, that not only are there fewer physicians in rural and ag areas, but that they're older. Because as we look sort of towards the future, it's not only how many are there, but then in the next 10 years, how many are there going to be left? Um, and so you can see, um, and I've highlighted the valley here, it's about 30%, and this is active licensed physicians, and I'm, I'm gonna show you another one later, but 30% are over 60, so all the yellow bars is the percentage of physicians in that region who are over 60. Um, and then you can see sort of Northern and Sierra is over a third, it's 36% are over 60. So even if I show you the previous map, which is the current state of who the physicians are, when you break it down, um, unless there's a change on the inflow side, there's also gonna be a lot of retirements coming and actually happening now. So this looks like this is <clears throat> for the entire yeah. area of California that we, we have fairly old physicians. Is that what you're? Somewhat. I mean, the Sacramento area is doing pretty well. It's only 21% older physicians. Um, so there's, there's uh, the, in general, one of the things to say in California relative to other places is fewer medical schools and fewer residency training programs. So there's a lot of discussion on that as, as well as to some of the driving. So um, I also made just two graphics just to give also some sense of not only how many there are, but when we think about it, that there are certain um, health concerns that are more prevalent in the valley. So for example, when I mentioned the diabetes check earlier, diabetes is higher prevalence in the valley than in the state as a whole. Um, California diabetes prevalence is 9.8%, whereas in the valley it's 12.3. And so I did a little flip here. Um, each box is looking at the number of the estimated number of people with diabetes per primary care physician in that county, if that makes sense. So if we see in California, if we just average them all together, so this is a very gross average, um, there, every primary care physician would have on average of 200 diabetic patients. Um, and as you can see, sort of Fresno, Madera, it's two to 300, Merced County, it's three to 400. And as we get into really in the northern areas, there's both diabetes and low primary care supply, so you'll see six to 800 or so on. Um, and then similarly, one of the other issues, and mostly I'll talk about primary care, but this is a really big concern too, is mental health and access to mental health care um, in rural areas and ag areas. Um, so this is based on um, a survey which was asking people, in the last two weeks, how often did you have frequent mental distress? And, and, um, and, it, and the idea was to try to get a sense from a survey standpoint of people how bad their mental health was, where it was, was it 
it's frequent mental distress so bad that you are unable to work or unable to go to school or something to that um, effect. And so um, it's not exactly like having a psychiatric diagnosis, but the plus side of that is that it gets to a lot of people who are undiagnosed. Um, but this, again, is just to give you the relative scope per the psychiatry population, there's a thousand in California, and then as we get to our San Joaquin Valley counties, we're talking two to three thousand people per psychiatrist, out to Merced, Tulare, three to four thousand, Merced, eight thousand or so per psychiatrist in Merced County. Um, and of course, northern counties, particularly these are low population counties, and there are just no psychiatrists at all. So um, access to mental health care is going to be very challenging um, with in both rural areas and ag areas, um, and even for the, those with the most severe conditions where, where you would want to bring in a psychiatrist. Um, okay, so that was the big picture report, trying to give a sense of just where the valley is relative to the state, um, and generally that there are not a lot of docs. Um, oh, and I should say throughout, I'm showing pictures uh, from the San Joaquin Valley Interprofessional bus tour if anyone wants to go, and I'll talk about that at the end. Um, so, this is from Bakersfield. Um, it is from the top of a park. I can't remember, it has this very nice name, but it's actually looking over an oil field. <laughs> okay, so this is now specifically um, work that I did after, after that report where I'm just trying to look at the, the valley providers themselves. These are those who are in primary care. Um, and I will say this is from 2015 because 2017 hasn't been analyzed yet, who said they're providing patient care at least 20 hours a week. Um, and so in looking at that distribution of this specific group, then we have over 35% are over 60 years old. So this group is slightly older. Um, and then in contrast to sort of what we see in the graduating and trainee population, it's 72% male and 28% female. So Medicine's been at gender parity for a little while now, coming out of schools, um, and in some parts of our state, the Bay Area, there's slightly more females than males, but in the Valley, it's still very heavily male. And it very, it, and it tracks a little bit with also the age distribution, obviously older physicians are more, far more males, but even in the younger age groups, there's still more male than female physicians in the Valley than compared to other parts of the state. Um, so one of the things that um, I look at, one of the other <laughs> workforce things I look at is tends to be on um, race and ethnicity and what we call underrepresented minorities in medicine, which tend to, um, which it kind of varies, but for this graphic, I'm adding in African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, and certain Southeast Asian groups. Um, and so in this category, the they're called underrepresented minorities, and so that's what URM stands for. The percentage of uh, primary care providers in the Valley who are underrepresented minorities is actually quite a bit higher than the state average. Um, so for example, within this category, it's probably, with this sort of designation, it's quite a bit lower. Um, the state average, for example, is only 5% of physicians in the state are Latino, for example, even though our state population is 50% Latino. Um, and the other thing that I looked at here, and um, I see now it's hard to see, is whether or not people graduated from U.S. medical schools or whether or not they're international medical graduates. Um, and you can, s and it's hard to see here, but almost half the physicians in the Valley are international medical graduates. Um, and so that means there are a few medical schools which do draw U.S. Um, born students who go there in the Caribbean and come back. I don't have that differentiation, but for the most part, it's still people who were born, raised, or went to medical school in another country and then have come to the United States. Um, and this is, I don't actually have a reference for how this compares to other rural areas. I think it's a, quite a bit higher, actually. Um, but in general, international medical graduates have been an important source of healthcare in rural areas across the country. Um, there, it's been part of a visa program in order to try to fill out some of the healthcare needs of underserved areas. Okay, so, um, but I, 
I've been, you know, looking at all these big counts, and as I said, I'm interested in, in access to care for for some of our more vulnerable populations. So the next stage that I'm in at, at the moment is I wanted to look at we've got all these big numbers. Who's actually taking care of the medical patients? If you know nearly half your population in your region is um, uninsured or has medical, and 40% are on medical, then I wanted to get a sense of who's available, what's available for people in medical. Um, and so what we had started out with last summer was we were started looking through all the medical managed care directories <laughs> for um, for the region. What it means is every time you have a health insurance plan, for example, your your health plan will give you a directory that you can either search online or an actual heavy tome um, that says, okay, these are all the, the providers in our network. Um, and so focused on primary care, and speaking of those undergraduates, they work very hard in going through and trying to manually create this database of just looking up each one in the directory and putting it into the data set. We looked, and we I had them extract a couple bit more information on what their specialty was, their degree, and what languages they spoke. Um, and just to give you a sense of the complexity of this, it sounds straightforward um, when you don't get into the weeds, but the reality is there's six health plans serving the San Joaquin, San Joaquin Valley, Sierra, serving the eight San Joaquin Valley counties. And then each plan has different counties that they serve. So she's got, one of my students created this so we could just get a sense of what was going on. Where if you want to look up Anthem Blue Cross, it serves four counties, but each of those counties has another plan that's also serving them, but not necessarily the same one. And so um, we found there were certainly a lot of um, challenges and we pull the data, but then there's gonna be trying to find duplicates and so on. And it always makes me think about how hard it is to be a patient. <laughs> you're trying to figure out who you're supposed to go to, who you can go to. You may not even know, because I've heard this plenty of times when you have Medi-Cal, it's this really weird thing to find this is relatively new, switching everyone to managed care, that you have one of two plans that you're supposed to have a choice of, and so on. Um, so I had my research student a couple months, and in the time period as they started doing this, and we got through all of the plans in all the counties except for Anthem Blue Cross, which was proprietary, the state also started to then put out a website with an online searchable directory. <laughs> so <laughs> there are always times when, you know, you think it's, sometimes it's easier to have administrative data or secondary data that you don't have to collect yourselves and sometimes it can be more confusing. Um, or sometimes you're like, oh wait, should we have just been going to ask the state, can they give us a directory rather than having these, you know, poor team of undergraduates slowly hand entering each one. <laughs> Um, and so we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the state then put this online. Of you can search by your county um, and look for all the primary care providers in your county. Um, and so I'm actually at a decision point of, so far it's a little hard to get data from the, the state, but I could keep on trying. Um, you could try to fill out the Anthem Blue Cross from, from the state um, website or doing what we had been, which was fine, trying to find some other way we get our hands on Anthem directories. Um, so some of the things that have come up that have been confusing. Um, there's real discrepancies between what we've created from our internal database and what is now available on the state website online. And, and the first one being that on the yellow bar is if you look it up on the state's website, um, if you look at primary care providers, these are the numbers, the totals that you'll see on the state website. Um, so you'll see 669 primary care providers in San Joaquin County. When my assistants pulled the directories from the health plans of San Joaquin County, they only came up with 213. So um, I'm, one of the challenges I'm in the middle of dealing with right now is trying to figure out what are we gonna do to resolve those um, and which data are correct. There are certain some issues uh, I've identified already, which is we've tried to Ours is looking at the unduplicated providers. So I've noticed that in the state listing, if it's someone who's serving a county but maybe located in a different county, they'll still be in that county. Um, and so it gets confusing. And so I think there's duplication going on. I don't know if there's a timing factor. We had to, we use the most, 
we use last year's most recently available directories, and I don't know if contracts have changed and there are new ones this year that the state has, but I think the discrepancy is too large for, for the contract to be an issue. But um, so I think it's been surprising to see how difficult it is just to count even. I'm not even at, at the hypothesis testing point, <laughs> but just counting who takes Medi-Cal. <laughs> just that basic, it seemed like a straightforward question. And then the implications are really large. Um, if I use sort of the CHIS population estimates of how many Medi-Cal residents there are in that county, um, so this ratio is the number of Medi-Cal enrollees per supposed Medi-Cal provider. There, this estimate is wildly different depending on whose data I use. So um, in San Joaquin County, by the state directory, it looks like there are about 350 primary, 350 Medi-Cal enrollees for every primary care provider, but in ours, it's 1,100. So um, this is one of those, as I said, it's the work in progress of trying to figure out what's going to, how we get to closer to what we think is a better estimate. Um, so the next part I'm gonna sort of shift gears. Um, that was a lot of the data and the numbers piece. Um, and what I've also been doing is doing interviews. Um, and so we've been sort of just slowly trying to collect interviews on primary care providers in the Valley, asking them about their experiences. Um, what are their challenges in practice? Successful strategies for getting into practice and then sort of their journey, why are they practicing in the Central Valley? Their thoughts on retention and then I'll get to in a little bit there in, at the end of the interview there are a few specific questions um, and in the latter half which um, that was funded by the the Ag Center is I asked if um, this sort of second latter half of the sample about their experiences caring for agricultural workers um, and so so far we've done 28 interviews um, they've been recorded and they're either over the phone or in person it's been hard to do in person, as you know, covering the region, but we, I have, when it was possible, gone down and driven around to, to meet people at their offices. Um, and so some of the major themes have come that have come out, um, I start out every interview with a very broad question, what is your biggest challenge in practice? And almost every single person brings up something related to the shortage of other physicians or other providers that has been um, the hardest thing that they feel that they're dealing with. And it usually falls on one of two things. It's either there's no other docs and I can't get specialty care, or there's not enough of my colleagues and I'm overburdened and I'm overworked and um, the volume is too high. And also that in addition is that the patients are really complex. And I gave just a little nods to it earlier, but chronic disease is high, multiple chronic conditions is high in the valley and mental health issues are high. And so, there, some of them have felt like even what I train for as, you know, quote unquote regular primary care, I'll have maybe one patient or two out of the 20 I see who is not complicated. Um, and there's burnout. Um, there's, there's burnout from not having enough other colleagues. Um, there was one provider I talked to who really felt that because he couldn't get his patient into CHEI for um, incredibly long delay that it, his patient ultimately died and it just depended on the shortest delays that I heard people talking about were maybe three months up to a year and then particularly for patients who are uninsured they said sometimes we just do without because there's nothing we can do. So this was actually from a director of a community health center network who had said you know all of my clinics are 25 to 30 percent short on staff. Um, one of the interesting things that happened out of the Affordable Care Act was there were more grants for community health centers to expand. And then with having Medicaid expansion, the community health centers felt like there was more possibility for them to expand because now they would have patients who actually had insurance reimbursement. Um, and he said, at this point though, I'm not building anymore because I can build a center and I can put up the walls and I have no one to staff it. Um, and then this is from another uh, physician who's saying, you know, it's just, it's been really bad. And he says, my patients, like, they feel like they're being forgotten because they have to wait so long for an appointment. Uh, 
Um, other challenges are that I think are what you might expect, the transportation is an issue in the Valley, getting patients being able to see them or see specialists, um, the health literacy of the patient population, insurance coverage issues, um, the high poverty rates in the region, and then the sense that in the Valley, healthcare and medicine is slower to innovate. There are some physicians who felt like there are things they wanted to do better, but they felt that either their community or their leadership was behind. Um, and this was sort of a combination of the shortage and the transportation where they say, so for one person says, so for example, I have patients who have a lot of pain management needs. I can't find anyone who takes Medi-Cal and the closest place I can send them to is two hours away. And that was pretty common. If they were lucky, the closest you could send them to may be Fresno, but just as often people talk about trying to send their patients to the Bay Area or LA. And then I'm gonna talk about this more, but the one exception was anybody I talked to from Kaiser. Um, they, they generally didn't list most of these. They did mention, you know, because it's Kaiser, they recognize their members who tend to be slightly more well off. Um, they did not have problem trouble with special care access um, and some of the transportation issues they felt were alleviated between either having all their services on site or they had access to more video and other health information and communication technologies. Um, in the questions, so again, I, I didn't get to ask the entire sample of this, so but the latter half when I asked them about caring for agricultural workers, um, I think one of the main points was I asked people if they had any training about caring for farm workers or anybody in some segment of ag, and everyone said no. Uh, one of the issues is that, um, as we mentioned earlier, there aren't a lot of training programs in the Valley, and so most of the physicians that I'm going to, if I try to pull a sample and talk to are people who didn't train in the Valley, and it's the one person I'd said, talked to who said they had felt they had a little training, <coughs> Um, not necessarily specific for the farm workers in the valley, but some sense of it was because someone had gone to Illinois in med for medical school and, and, and residency and had and their program had been in central Illinois and so they felt like there was some affinity. Um, but generally there was, um, if an organization brought them in or even if they were recruited, there's one provider I talked to who was actually came in as part of a training fellowship where the organization, it was a nurse practitioner, and they would actually train the nurse practitioners for the first few months. Um, she said even that training fellowship didn't include anything, any segments or curriculum that was specific about caring for farm workers or agricultural workers. Um, I did ask them, you know, what are their, you know, what are they seeing in their patients who are farm workers? And they said, Generally, they felt their, their farm workers were the sicker, the sicker or maybe the sickest patients that they had. Their biggest concerns were that they had multiple chronic conditions and that their patients were unable to come in very frequently, and so care was really intermittent. Trying to do any management of the chronic conditions was just intermittent. Um, and then, the, other than that, they they brought up just um, con the concerns necessarily because they were saying well, musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, skin conditions, respiratory health, and then mental health concerns as well. Um, something that also came up that was, some people referred to it when I asked about their farm workers, and sometimes it came up when we talked about immigrants, was they were, they were seeing spikes in anxiety and depression around immigration enforcement. Um, so, it, and, then, and then it would come, and then depending on the time of year and who I talked to, it seemed to be coming in waves um, earlier in the, Administration, there was a lot of fear that it seemed to go down, and then there'd be periodic like the next town over had an ice raid, and suddenly all of my patients stopped coming, um, or they're not signing up for Medi Cal anymore, and then just there's a lot of just the overall mental health um, has been impacted negatively. Um, and then the other thing that sort of stood out was just simply there's a sort of dichotomy. Um, again, as I was saying earlier. Um, it used to be the traditional model in, in rural areas was, you know, you'd have a town doctor and see everyone, but it's not really what we have here. I, people I talked to would either be like, I don't have any farm workers, or I have a lot. There was not, there were, I didn't really talk to anybody who had some kind of seeming mix of I have a few or I have some. It was very much like all or none. Um, 
um, and just given our location, I thought I'd say um, the I did also ask people about environmental concerns to get a sense of what physicians think about environmental concerns in, in the valley, and um, nearly everyone would bring up air quality. I did also ask, and this was related to um, the folks at the Center for Environmental, Environmental Health Sciences Core Center were interested about um, also physician knowledge on environmental issues, and I asked about water. Um, and generally their knowledge was limited, um, or it would be I've heard about it in some other town that was sort of vague. And um, for some, and some acknowledge, you know, it, it's, it might be hard. So one said it's probably happening, but it's hard for us to see the changes. So they're seeing part of it is they felt that the consequences of poor water access and poor water quality sometimes would happen over a long period of time, and they might not see it. Um, and then the other thing that did come up was it was a sort of a recruitment and retention problem in terms of getting other positions. That a few of them would mention they either had a hard time getting colleagues to stay in the valley or they, they knew some who left because those providers were concerned about the environmental quality in the valley. Um, so, and so one is like, I love my community, I love my job, but the air is really bad. And so that came up a couple do I want to raise a family here? You know, that people have questioned, do they want to raise their family here? Um, should we be worried ourselves about living here? Um, and so, again, in that bigger questions of, we were asking, as us about this, because again, it's that bigger question of why is it so hard? You know, why this shortage that I showed you, all those numbers I showed you, that's not a new problem. <laughs> there have never been, not never, but, you know, for a long time now, we also thought there not being enough docs and not enough healthcare providers in general in the Valley. Um, and I think one of the things I wanted to highlight was there was a big difference um, by gender and responses when I talked to people about what they saw as issues. Um, when I talked to men, they usually talked about the cultural amenities and there being a lack thereof, that it wasn't an attractive place, there weren't places to go out to eat, or things to do for fun, unless and that it generally had a poor reputation as a place to live. Um, women almost all across the board, the first thing they mentioned was it's hard to get other women because their their partners don't have a job here, there aren't job opportunities here, or if you're a single woman, you're not going to find a partner here in the Valley. Um, and so there was a really big sort of, it was just sort of striking. Like both groups eventually would start to mention these things. Men wouldn't mention the partners as much, but women certainly also brought up the cultural amenities and so on. But it was just sort of the striking difference of what they emphasized and what they chose to mention. Um, and then the other thing that came up um, was they felt, they felt it was particularly in the last few years, there was a lot of regional competition with Kaiser. That they felt that they're struggling with, there are not enough people who want to come to the Valley, and then even when they do, Kaiser's taking them all. And certainly people in the across the, all the other settings, people in private practice, community clinics, smaller towns, the bigger cities, they all said the same thing if they were not from Kaiser, that we're really struggling with recruiting people from Kaiser because Kaiser's taking them. Is there some reason for that? <laughs> Why is Kaiser so? Well, I think we, we'll summarize some of it, but certainly, so this is one of the quotes um, from the non-Kaiser perspective was, you know, they have a higher salary and they can bonuses for signing up, and they can have nice benefit packages and retirement plans and, and, and such, that they felt that there was a lot more financially and some job security-wise that Kaiser would offer. Um, but, the, but then, kind of then, continuing on the line of gender differences, and I think what's been interesting to me and what I like about doing qualitative research is I kind of went in this without really, it was very exploratory. I knew what I wanted to do was interview group of providers because most of the other studies on rural providers that were qualitative tended to be almost entirely on um, interviews with men, um, and particularly non-Hispanic white men. So my aim here was just to get a more diverse group, and I just realized I should have presented the sample to you, <laughs> which is slightly a majority of women and um, fairly racially ethnically diverse. But So the other things that came up were um, there were starting to be gender differences in the first couple interviews, so I changed the interview a bit to ask people if they felt their experience 
professionally was affected at all by their gender. And um, again, women tended to report experiences of sexism, um, feeling the work environment was unsupportive, um, experiences of harassment, uh, of being denied leadership or advancement opportunities. Um, and so, for example, one said, I have kids and a family. I was always on the blacklist in my group. Um, another one said that she felt she had trouble getting specialty referrals. Um, and she said, so I would be very careful before I made a call and you know, tried to call a specialist directly. And she's like, if it's a female, you had to be really buttoned up because you, otherwise you're just wasting my time. Um, and, and probably about four or five mentioned they changed jobs because they felt their environment was, um, was really unpleasant to the sexism. Um, but on, the, on a positive note, particularly those in pediatrics and, and more so in family medicine had felt that as their profession was reaching gender parity within their own group, that it was getting better. That they, um, they were, there were one or two who had said over the 10 years they'd been able to institute some changes in policy. Um, but it was, it was nevertheless really strikingly different um, compared to asking the same question of men and um, none of these issues came up. Uh, if you ask the men, you know, what is, did you feel like there's any, you know, does your gender or the gender of others affect, you know, the professional experiences? Primarily it was either I don't think there's a difference or just that patients would like to see female patients and providers. <laughs> Um, and so I think the same thing, it was really interesting, just not only what was said, but just the contrast in the way the responses were and what was, what was not being said. Um, I think, but I won't post it on the slides, and some of the quotes are fairly graphic, so I'm gonna just give one example of one um, where one female I talked to said that an example of their work environment was that their colleagues would put up um, pictures of pornography on the computers in their their work and office area on a regular basis. Um, so we also, I also talked to providers about, you know, did you feel like there's a difference in your practice or how you think your race or ethnicity or, or your nativity affects your practice? Um, there were, the, the physicians who identified as Latino or Hispanic had said they had had really positive experiences. They felt a lot that they get a lot of positive feedback from patients and from their colleagues for their linguistic abilities, for their cultural resonance, and for them practicing in the valley really means a lot. I had, there were a number I talked to who grew up in the valley, a few who had grown up as their parents were farm workers, and for them being in practice um, was really rewarding and felt like they, they were giving back. Um, for other groups, it was it was a bit mixed, um, kind of in parallel with the physician population in the state. I only had one um, participant who was African American who did have a really um, had had quite a bit of discomfort and ultimately left the valley as well. Um, and so you can see the contrast. Um, the first person was saying, "Someone will tell their neighbor I'm here. I speak Spanish and I get it, and it's been great." And the other person who had said, "Who was African American?" Said, I, "You know, I felt like all the time I watched my tone." to watch my body language, and I was really careful about what I said. Um, and they had said part of the reason they left the valley was because they felt like it wasn't necessarily good for their African-American child as a place to grow up. Um, and then it's similarly, um, there was a mix on both perceptions of international graduates and immigrants, physicians uh, from the non-immigrant positions and vice versa. Um, there was a mix of like, there's a lot of gratitude for the immigrant physicians for coming and serving in the community. Um, and then there's also the other half of sort of suspicion. I don't have a quote up here, but it was sort of like, they're just coming here to get their visa and then they're gonna leave. Um, and there was that perception of it, um, as well as people who were simply like, this was great, it was an opportunity to come. And some who felt like it was challenging because there wasn't, and particularly in the smaller towns, you know, there not necessarily gonna find someone of their own ethnic group or background, and, and so one person had said, if I really felt part of the community, I would, I would, it would help me be happier. And there was a lot of mixed feelings about the sense of community. Um, some were very positive and some were not um, on this as an issue. Oh, I'm running out of time, I better hurry through this. Okay, the last um, 
similar as I said, I was also not necessarily something I, I went in, but this actually came up within the first uh, few interviews, so that also became part of my interview guide. <coughs> LGBTQ uh, physicians. Um, I started talking to a, a couple, I think perhaps because they were motivated to be interviewed about this, where they had probably the worst experiences of harassment and discrimination um, professionally. Um, so one was like, I felt like I had a big flag on my chest. What that um, person was talking about was they felt that they got a lot of harassment from the nursing staff and from their colleagues. Um, there was, um, they described a lot of um, actually pretty disturbing stories. Uh, losing hospital privileges when they came out. Um, being excluded from insurance contracts. And, and a lot of them saying that and the, the people I talked to, I, can, I actually had a very hard time finding anybody who was in practice to talk to. Um, I ended up talking to people who left and one person who was thinking about leaving. And, then, and these were all uh, women um, and they had said they didn't, and I was trying to get other references and, then, and one after another would say, every gay man I know has left the valley. Um, they talked about um, how their experience had been that there was some, a bit more openness in residency, and so if they came and they weren't from the Valley originally, they would get through residency, but then they would get to know more of the surrounding community and then they would leave. Or if they were from the Valley originally, they just deliberately stay closeted professionally. Um, I talked to one person who was trying to advocate for LGBTQ issues, who had said that, um, in this person's perception, things were getting slightly better in that some people were coming out if they were, say, an anesthesiologist or a radiologist or somebody who didn't see patients regularly. And I asked also about primary care, and they're like, no, no one in primary care is going to be out. Um, and, and so um, it was, um, the, it was really quite the same thing as, again, going the same, was really quite the contrast. And when I talked to in the other interviews, as I asked about the issue, this was the one question that would shut down a lot of people. Um, usually when you're doing a qualitative interview, and you might ask even about sort of race, ethnicity, and people are just sort of generally willing to talk about themselves, their patients, and so on, but um, otherwise it was like, it's not a problem, I don't really think about it, was really the most common other response that I got. Um, so I had one person who noted that they, um, they did, get this sense that if you were perceived as being LGBTQ friendly, they were concerned that your other patients would stop coming. Okay. So, um, over to all the different limitations of the project, a lot of it is med board data, um, so obviously I didn't talk about DOs, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, a lot of other people who are important in primary care. Um, and again, like I said, I'm still trying to figure out the Medi-Cal piece of it, and then even the directory is obviously not going to be the same as who actually takes Medi-Cal. Um, there are audit studies who show that if you survey physicians and ask them if they take Medi-Cal, but then if you call them up and actually try to make an appointment, it's probably about a 30% drop off on who actually will see the Medi-Cal patient. Um, some of this is very broad. I've shown you data on counties. Um, a qualitative study is looking at a lot of different themes. It's not, not making generalizability about what's going on across the whole. Um, and then obviously, I'm talking a lot about what's happening in the workforce and the supply. Um, and the next stages are looking at what does that mean for actual access to quality care. Um, in conclusion, um, one of the things that's been interesting to me over this time is that from a federal, federal perspective, the population of LA is so large, it's not generally considered a rural a lot of it is not considered rural because of the population density. Um, but <laughs> the healthcare access problems are really still pretty much in parallel with the same as any as many other rural areas in the country. Um, that there's, and, and both, you know, in general, the, the challenges are both that health needs are high and the capacity to care for people is low. Um, and this is really consistent with there are other reports done, there are not enough nurses in the valley. There's, a definite real concern about mental behavioral health access and then long-term care is another really big issue of where are we going to get the long-term care workforce. 
Um, and the other thing that came up a couple times when I talked to people is they said they also just had a real hard time struggling to find hired good support staff. So if they wanted a clinic manager, if they wanted a medical assistant, um, that was also really hard. Um, other things that there's, there's, it can get to be this vicious cycle that the shortage leads to burnout, which leads to more shortage. Um, and, and so there, some of the thinking is gonna have to be around how do we deal with the burnout um, for even the providers who are there. Um, specialty care access, it seems like nothing has changed particularly in 13 years from my anecdotal experience to what I'm finding research-wise, and one of the challenges is, is that there's not a lot of real big policy levers for specialty care, um, other than Medi-Cal coverage. You know, we talk about community health centers, they're, um, that's currently, at least in our healthcare system, the answer for a lot of primary care gaps is trying to support these community health centers and to get grants for them and they, they get higher reimbursement under Medicaid and Medicare. Um, same thing with hospitals. Hospitals get reimbursed for taking care of more, you know, Medicaid uninsured sort of patients and there's really not something for ambulatory specialty care along those lines. Um, same thing, loan repayment. Our state, most federal loan repayments, primary care, our state will have there's certainly a push to try to have low repayment, and there's low payment for psychiatry. Um, there's a real shortage of general surgeons, um, but there's really nothing else out there for all the other specialties. Um, I think there's another question that's troubling me and I'm trying to figure out going forward is um, one thing to talk about health system consolidation in policy, which means it's just healthcare systems are growing bigger and bigger. And what does that mean um, for access to care for vulnerable populations? Are we either you know, moving towards this more and more segmented divide where if Kaiser grows and they don't, if they don't take Medi-Cal, then where are all the Medi-Cal patients going to go? We don't have, um, we're losing certainly that model of private practices that's, that balance out a variety of patients. Um, and then there are other issues, something that else that came up in the interview. Um, one of the other big players in the Valley is the Adventist Health System, which just rebranded itself, but I don't it's called. Um, they, they were instrumental actually in keeping Tulare Regional Medical Center reopening the hospital and so um, that was seen as you know good for the community but certainly um, the growth of Adventist is also what is driving some fear in the LGBTQ population um, that one of the Adventist system um, centers was described to me in the story as pushing out a known transgender physician who had been in a small town for a good 15 years. And then as they grew and acquired the practices around that person, basically ensured that that person was um, not given a Medi-Cal contract and that person eventually left town. So um, there are some questions. As organizations get bigger, there's positives for maybe keeping the infrastructure in place. If they can manage to care for a different range of vulnerable populations, or is it going to be making it harder for low-income communities to, to get health care? Um, and then certainly as we talked about the training, <laughs> I think for this group training, we're certainly preparing for farm workers. Um, I didn't, what I didn't get to was um, there, I, I didn't have a conversation about this as much for the UCSF Fresno uh, residency program where you know, you know there are things they're working on, but that's one program out of a whole region. Um, and then for a long time now, people who worry about rural access to care have talked about as medicine reaches gender parity and it's harder to get women in rural areas, is that also going to make it harder um, in, the, um, in terms of getting docs? And I think one of the things that, and usually the focus has been on the partner issue or the social isolation issue, and I think just because of the timing of the interviews I was doing, the issues of harassment and discrimination have come up more in because that's also been more out in the national conversation as well. And do we need to think about that as an issue as well for rural areas? Um, and is there, and as we shift towards larger health organizations, so even, for example, we talk about community health centers, one community health center organization in the Valley has 71 clinics. So even if some of those clinics are one 
DARC or one PA or one MP in a small town, they're still part of a larger organization. <coughs> and if it's two of them or something like that, does it mean you might see more harassment or discrimination because we don't have you know solo or two practice providers, or does it mean that there's opportunities also for redress because people are part of an organization? Um, and then certainly for so so do you say sexual orientation, gender identity, minorities? Um, the perception is that discrimination issues aren't getting better in the Valley, and so that becomes also a deterrent to recruiting and retaining providers. Um, it's certainly not going to be the majority of the positions, but in an area that you really feel like you can't afford to lose anyone, do you want to lose 10% of who you could possibly have? And then what are the implications for disparities for LGBTQ? Care if this is the environment that the physicians themselves are experiencing. Um, other things, immigration policy. Um, there was a drop off in international in, uh, medical graduate applications to residency positions after um, the <coughs> first um, bans were announced by our administration for the whole country. So there was sort of a 20% residency drop off. So there's that's going to become a rural healthcare workforce issue if there continues to be perception that the United States is not welcome to international graduates. Um, and then something else that I'm not sure that people in healthcare think about now is that is the environment is a workforce issue. And that environmental quality is going to be an area that also makes it hard to get workers. And I'm sorry, I'm going right past my time. So I'll finish up. Um, I'll just mention it then. There, there was a state commission that talked about strategies for increasing the workforce using teams, telehealth, new medical schools and training programs. And the pictures are from, and I, this is my plug, um, this is Jan Margaret Garcia. She runs a Central Valley bus tour uh, trip in the springtime. It's a great experience. You visit a lot of different towns. You learn about the history of the valley. A number of students are from the valley are there, and they will talk about their experiences. Some of the towns are chosen based on where the students are from. And so it's a great experience. I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, and then so I think I've already alluded to some of the things that where do we go from all this? There's a, a number of different branch off points that I'm interested in. Um, and looking also kind of trying to get a sense of what's happening in the future. Healthcare policies in flux, immigration policies in flux, um, population in flux. So, anyways, I'll stop there. <laughs> special scholarships or positions to students who say we will practice yes. in the Central Valley. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of that program and do you think and how may it influence where people may go to provide uh, medical I mean I, I care? think that the principle is great. I, I think for sure I think across the board people say most often they feel the best strategy for getting people to work in the valley is getting people who are from the valley. A um, couple things, it's really small. This year's first year medical student cohort is six. Um, it's Out of a total of, do you know how many? Uh, of the, all the UC Davis students? Uh, when I'm, yeah, uh, six out of 100 or? Yeah, it's around 100, 100 I think so. About 100. Um, it's yeah. in flux, so some of the things I kind of sped by were, um, the, uh, so, on that particular program, I mean, I've, so I also work with some of the students in that program and they're great. I um, think it's a great idea, but it's, it's just very small and that the current configuration is gonna go away. Um, they're gonna move to UCSF and then UC Davis is gonna then start its own version and, and so that will be, um, I think we're, our own campus is still trying to figure it out. But I agree, it, um, it's part of this whole basket of programs called Prime um, that are on all the different UC campuses um, with and they each have their own regional flavor of trying to get students to work in underserved areas. But I think it's the training experience that is tricky. Yes. Well, it was interesting because my experience, the three who were there, they were all front row center and were the ones who were asking the questions after my lecture. <laughs> 
So I, I would say they, it's interesting, I think they probably, because they also feel like in terms of bringing people who are not from the Valley to come practice there, that most people who aren't from the Valley don't know about the air, air quality either. Most of the time it came up with people who are living there and then in a short period of time, then as they got to know more, or it would be like my child had really bad asthma, so they left, or um, there was one person who had said that they had, then later in their career started attending a lot of public health lectures about the environmental quality of the valley, got really scared, and Matt made them think about, should we be leaving? Um, yeah. I, I wonder if, from what you're saying, Kaiser doesn't actually just have the answer, which is to say to have a, ro a more robust healthcare system and compensate professionals better you will get people there. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if all of the um, if, if all of the advantage is in other parts of the state in terms of paying back loans and having a yeah. good system to work in yeah. and getting a good salary, yeah. it's not really that folks in the Central Valley are competing with Kaiser so much as they are competing with Sacramento and Los Angeles and San Francisco. It was interesting. Yeah, the folks within Kaiser. Were a number of them were people who had been in the who were in the valley already, and then they just left and went to Kaiser, and it was very much I just the practicing within Kaiser is just easier, and I feel like I can do what I want to do and do provide good care, and so it was, it was just interesting because everyone outside was like it's just they have more money and they have more benefits, and and I think the people who were at Kaiser were also talking about just their experience of practicing there, but one Kaiser person at one of the Kaisers I talked to did admit that most of the time right now they're just recruiting people from within the valley and getting, basically they would keep their ear to the ground of who was unhappy in their town and then try to pull them over. Um, but they have plans because of the strength of their system. One of the partners for the new UC Davis program is they want to have our medical students do more rotations with them. They want to, they have, Kaiser's putting in its own money to, to start their own residency programs. But I don't believe any of the people I talked to Concerns <laughs> or concerning them with living there. <laughs> so I'm curious. I'm in the nutrition department, so I would like to know if in your interviews, yes. did that come up at all? As A little bit, yeah. An issue in is with the patient population. Yes, uh, mostly that that the patients couldn't get access to healthy food. That that certainly came up. And do they recognize? Do they see nutrition as sort of this? that they would also want to refer patients to and thinking about like the prevalence of diabetes and other kinds Yes, of they did and they just sort of fell into a dichotomy of either those at federal or qualified health centers, community health centers would, would have the nutritionist or they would say we were looking at partnerships with nutritionists. Um, they, they just did a lot more of the nutritionist or dietitian and health educator and team component model. Um, and similarly, the Kaiser folks, and then those in other private practices were saying, we would like to do this, but it was either the culture is behind or we don't have money for it. You know, we don't get the money that FQHCs do, so 